This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is noon on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here at downtown Honolulu in our Think Tech studio with our show, Where the Drone Leads. And all you faithful out there who watch this show every week, in fact, probably work your life around this show, uh, normally we'd normally have a drone on the table here to act as a table decoration and a focus of our conversation. Today there isn't one. The reason we're talking about the other side of the drone business, and that is the issue of counter drone or countermeasures against drones that are in the wrong place or uh, unintended or perhaps even maliciously being used. And that's going to be a major factor as the whole uh, emergence of drones enters our infrastructure and our school systems and our life. We still have to understand that there are uh, potential uh, downside uses and we got to protect against those. And so counter drone, as uh, austere as it may sound, is a term that's going to be very important as we go forward here in the future. Anyway, we have one of the leading experts in that subject uh, online with us today. Mr. John Mullen, CEO and President of Promia in San Francisco on the Embarcadero. John's been on the show numerous times and he's joining us again. John, welcome aboard. Thank you, Ted. Good to see you. Hey, same here. And uh, I think we're both getting older, John. I don't quite know how that works, but uh, judging by the hair color and such, uh, that may be going on on both ends here. <laughs> You're laughing about it. That's okay. Anyway, uh, John, uh, this, this, again, we have a short time on the show. It's only a half hour now, but, and this subject is worth a lot more than that. But, but let's hit the highlights of what's taking place in the domain of counter drone. And I'm thinking really here on the civil side. We certainly know that on the military side, it's a very active issue, and there's all the way to, to uh, uh, kinetic takedown and such and counter operations. But in, on the civil side, we have to be very careful about that. So we still think in the terms of detect and track and identify. And so what's, what have you seen lately, I get JPEX and such, that have uh, pushed us forward in that direction? I saw a, a lot of new uh, ideas and programs in JPEX. They reorganized the, the group there, so it's a new, new team, new, new thing, and started a smaller crowd than before, but some very interesting technologies. Um, the one we're focused on a lot is communication from the ground station to the device. Because, as you know, uh, most drones, most commercial drones, use standard unlicensed radio bands to, uh, to communicate, which is a, a pretty vulnerable uh, spot. So we're, our, our side is mainly looking at alternate communication, both as a counter drone uh, and then also sharing with our offensive uh, drone partners uh, a way to uh, manage communications without being jammed is basically the idea. And uh, that's, that's where we're looking the most right now because we think that's the most vulnerable spot. Okay, so you're suggesting that the communication link between a ground controller that, a, that an operator is running a drone with and the drone itself, that electronic link, that's the area that is uh, potentially most useful in the tracking and identification? And also, um, that's easiest to, uh, to subvert uh, with the jamming tool. So if you can obfuscate that link with using multiple simultaneous radio links or, or various techniques to counter jam, then you are one step up on your adversary who's trying to bring you down. So uh, I think that's the key area for uh, investigation, one of them anyway. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier the kinetic, kinetic where you, you actually blast either some sort of gun or net or something at the, the drone to bring it down, and that certainly has value is you can get close enough to do it. But uh, most counter drones that we see right now use jamming devices to try to bring down the, the adversary. And the, the key, of course, to that is the tracking and identification and locating uh, prior to the jamming, I would imagine. So if I think on the civil sure. side where jamming is probably still not quite something the FCC allows, uh, we had to think of focusing in on the other pieces, the the, the passive pieces, the identification and the tracking. Is the radio sure. communication link still the same um, uh, method of, of achievement of that? Well, there, no, there's a lot of advancement going on there. There's a, a dozens of new products out. They do all follow kind of the same uh, acoustic sound 
for uh, radio frequency monitoring uh, are the two main ones. There's visual monitoring as well, and oftentimes a combination of the three. So you can either hear it with the sound, the actual audio sound, or you can uh, see the radio frequencies where it's communicating and talking, or you can see it visually itself. So those are the three main areas, and a lot of tools will use a combination of all three to identify. And then tracking, I think, is still in its infancy. Uh, you can track it, you can watch it either via video or with sound, but to put your own drone up right next to another drone and track it and move it in flight and stay right with it, we don't see anybody yet doing that. I mean, there's people claiming it, but we don't. We haven't really seen that happening too much yet. We think it's coming. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that aspect of it, of that sort of a passive-active combination. But in, in, in sticking with a purely passive piece, which is probably going to be the most... Uh, tenable in the world of uh, civil uh, infrastructure management and, and uh, land management and such, uh, the, the very issue of identification and tracking, even to the extent of just not knowing anything more than the, the general compass direction, uh, be, would, be, would all give us something a little stronger than we have right now, which isn't much. So if we were to take... Well, remember, oh, go ahead. the last call we had together, Ted, we talked about the ID, where there was a licensing through a, uh, an ID sequence, although we haven't seen that on the market yet. We certainly saw it in the standards groups, and we completely endorse that. We think it's a great idea. I think that's, yeah, that's right, and that's happening, John. We did, you're right. We did talk about that before. The, uh, there's an ARAC, Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee, the FAA is impaneled with a bunch of people on it to go figure out how to do that. Is it going to be ADSD? Is it going to be uh, some other form? Is it going to be AIS-like? Exactly what is it going to be? And then how is it going to be implemented? So once that happens, uh, the availability of that information to law enforcement or public safety, whoever might need it, uh, is going to be uh, available. So that means there will be ground stations coming up and such. And of course, the uh, interesting issue is here, the people who are going to be the non-compliance are the ones we aren't, that aren't going to have that capability. So, for example, a homemade drone or something like that wouldn't necessarily have that functionality in it. So we still will have this need for the passive tracking and identification. And I think also when you can identify somebody who's spoofing somebody else's address, that's even more likely a, a more suspect stealth partner. So, uh, and you know that that does happen in ships, ship IDs across the ocean. There's times that uh, you see two or three with the same ID. It's illegal, but they do it, right? So that's the sort of uh, thing you really look for if you can. Well, when we've seen some examples of uh, ship tracking in the Northwest Pacific uh, Marine Monument area, you'll see a lot of that. You'll see a lot of identification change uh, uh, frequently, a couple times a day sometimes. And uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's, if, it, if, it, if it can be spoofed, it probably will be, and the same will apply to unmanned earth systems. Nevertheless, I think the need is going to be there uh, and is always going to be there even with the uh, electronic fingerprint uh, coming coming forth so so once again if you were to imagine a say a major sports event uh, that draws international participation and therefore has interesting uh, profiles of people involved and is uh, perhaps there's others who want to disrupt that so if something like that were to occur uh, how would you envision setting up a, a police agency or a, a public safety agency with a base capability of determining that there are drones in flight and a general idea of their location uh, as a starter? You know, the, the aerospace guys, Matt uh, Banger and, and the others, have a tool they, they tested out back at the, at the Rose Parade, and that worked very well, surprisingly well, for identifying drones and their ground station from the, the signal. Uh, some, and there's many others that are coming out in that area. So that kind of technology, um, what I would hope we get someday is a national registry so that um, if, if, I'm, uh, if, if I've got a drone up in, in uh, San Jose, California, and uh, it's being tracked, and, and somebody has stolen the ID, and that's in Hawaii, then uh, when the police see it, they'll know that it's a, a stolen uh, ID. 
that that's future, obviously, but that's I think the sort of thing we need because if you're, if you're going to hide, you're going to steal somebody's ID and then go somewhere else and pretend you're them. So we need to we need to be able to look for things like that. That's not the basic. That's that's a little more advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, At the basic level, it's just the uh, providing the local police and and fire department, frankly, with uh, information about what's in their area of regard. Uh, and then it would be pretty much up to them to go figure out how to deal with it. Either identify and locate the operator by the physical nature of uh, ha having a controller in your hand or some other aspect of crowd behavior that would tell you that there's somebody in that area that is uh, providing the control function. So that, I think, is going to be or our base starting point has to be, which then again is a human component as well as the electron electronic component and uh, somehow expressed in some graphic display on a screen. Also, if, you, if you're if you using standard unlicensed van, a drone off the shelf, it's going to be very standard communication. And if they do that, it's going to be easy to jam and easy to bring down. However, if, if somebody makes their own and they're an expert in waveforms and they make a communication that's not standard, when the police try to jam it, it's not going to jam. And they'll know right away that this comes from somebody who's trying to hide. So right, and if that's the case, the sorts of, that, that's the sort of thing we look for, I think. I think that's right. That would be the identification of somebody who's pretty seriously and has some intent on his mind here that uh, it goes beyond the average person who simply bought something and is perhaps using it without proper education or attention to the, to the rules. Right. I think it'll be fairly simple for police to, you know, the small little jam gun to point it at a drone and it'll either go right down to the ground or it'll usually go back to its ground station. And that'll take care of, I would say, 90% of the nuisance or 95% of the nuisance drone. But, you know, the ones you're worried about are the nation states or the people that have very nefarious purposes and they'll have different kinds of uh, situations. And in that, in that situation, that more extreme situation, which is going to have to be more of an engineered solution with a lot of pieces in it, including acquisition, training, testing, transportation to the site, there's a number of other markers that would indicate that kind of a nation-state event taking place. And so that uh, the uh, left of launch, so to speak, would have to be where the primary focus is there. Right. And that's where I think a lot of your kinetic uh, responses come up. Because if somebody's actually got a fully autonomous with no communications, or they've got uh, a communication, like you say, DDL, where you do the uh, uh, disruption on the uh, uh, distress communications, then uh, you, you're going to have to go after it from the kinetic point of view when you tell them. You know, you bring up a really good point. Uh, as the automation gets better, and that's happening everywhere in cars and in vacuum cleaners in your house and everything, as the automation increases, uh, the mission can be programmed and it can be independent of any kind of ground communication. So we can't lay back and think that there's always going to be a communication link between the ground station and the drone that is going to be a dependable source of identification. Right, that's exactly right. And again, you're you're seeing the difference between the, lo the hobbyist who's got a nuisance drone or maybe the press event who wants to take pictures versus somebody who's much more serious and uh, I mean they just tested it this week Google just tested a glider that automatically seeks uh, thermals and automatically goes for thermals without any communication from the ground and uh, and will go seek and, and climb up higher based upon its own observed behavior so there's lots of sensors out there that are small you put the right kind of tiny computer in there that can pick up information from the sensors and have its own uh, its own program flight station, maybe 20 or 30 or 50 flight patterns, and each one changes based upon observable behavior. Now you've got a full autonomous drone. And to do that 50 times over, and you have a situation that would overwhelm the ability to respond to it in a heartbeat. That's right. And then, it, and then you know, there is a, a new uh, sniper rifle drone from Israel, that, and they've got, you know, half a dozen different kinds of guns on these things now in certain countries. So, uh, you know, that, that makes it more serious, much more serious. So we really have to take this thing seriously. We have to start at the civil side where systems that are non-kinetic will apply and then 
but but not limit ourselves because it, you're you're so right, John. The ability to ex to uh, uh, escalate becomes in your hands as the uh, as the various forms of automation and autonomy emerge in other aspects of this robotic world. So this is really an interesting and intriguing uh, part of the equation. Let's pick this the rest of this up uh, and talk about how we would implement something in the very near term. Uh, stay in, in Hawaii after we get back from our one minute break. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. And we are back. Ted Ralston here with our guest, John Mullen, in San Francisco, California, joining us. Uh, John, welcome aboard again, sir. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we've patched together a communication framework here. We beat Skype at its own game, and it tried to fail, and we got around it through various means of duct tape and microphones and uh, uh, conference speaker phones. So we're making it work, John. And, and once again, we conquered the, the, uh, the tyranny of 2,500 miles of ocean and, and have you trapped on the show. So uh, we're just talking at the first half here about the various pieces of technology and the components that, that, that define uh, the world of the threat, if you will, that we all have to think about in terms of drones and, and the general term counter drone. And now we have to think about how we would compose socially acceptable solutions that uh, don't set the wrong expectation and handle what can be handled and uh, with some kind of an intelligence framework figure out what it means when there's something that we can't handle. So we were talking earlier about the communications framework, the, the communications link between a ground controller and a drone is something that is a pretty good indication that there's activity underway. So if we start at that very simple level, John, uh, of the things you've seen, like at GIFX and uh, just on the market, what's the cost and what's the relative simplicity of putting something up in the back of a station wagon, we'll say, at a public event of some kind that can be used to generate that indication? The, uh for the offensive side, let's call it just drones, going out and doing what they're doing, the cost is coming down significantly and the quality is going up significantly and there's open standard tools, Artipilot and many of the others that can be configured and et cetera. So as far as a, maybe a hobbyist or a person who wants to fly a drone, it's, the market is, is just booming. Uh, lots of competition, lots of um, uh, high quality products cheap and it's coming the price is coming down to the um, so I mean for a, a very serious drone you can spend six to ten thousand dollars and get basically the state of the art of, of a standard quadcopter. I'm not talking a fixed wing or or any of those, but a standard quadcopter it's really come down a lot. A counter drone hasn't come down as much because there's not as many players. They're very serious players, some of them are the biggest companies in the world and uh, they're going after this and a lot of military, some are commercial, some are um, police and, and first responder and you know different kinds of approaches. Some of them have nets, some of them have, uh, have uh, different kinds of ways to knock out a, a drone. Most of them rely on jamming but uh, those prices are coming down as well. Uh, that, that product that is less defined. You see it's, it's pretty simple to put a definition, a specification up for a standard hobbyist drone. 
not as easy to put a specification up for a counter drone because there's different environments. There's you know open land, there's sea, there's you know how high are they flying, uh, what kind of drones are they. Uh, there, there's many different situations. Uh, so um, so the the uh, counter drone is not as mature, but it's coming along, right? Does that help answer? I think so. And so that tells us we're a couple of years away from some more of a standard and and uh, general approach. Uh, what did what kinds of technologies did you see, say at Jifix, that would that would uh, advance the side this side of it, the detection and identification side of it? Uh, well, I saw um, identification and, and uh, detection from combination of uh, waveform and uh, acoustic and visual. Uh, I saw a, a kinetic uh, beanbag approach to shooting another drone out. Um, I saw some vertical takeoff uh, drones that were very uh, impressive. The uh, Martin uh, V drone uh, that uh, you know you get um, a better uh, better uh, flight time and speed and um, load if you can do a combined vertical takeoff that then changes into horizontal. So there's there's those um, and uh, you know a lot of different uh, different kinds of approaches electronically. Uh, there is a lot going on in the waveform identification and uh, and also obfuscation, as I said, and then jamming. So that seems to be the key area that people are concentrating on. And in the waveform area, do you require a a catalog to look at to compare the current thing that you're you're looking at to a waveform catalog of some kind to make identification, or can you identify if that? Trying, if you're trying to hack in some of the drone uh, counterattacks, some of them just go after the electronic waveform and try to blast them. And that will uh, that will cause the communication to lapse so the drone will go back home. But there are some, a more advanced group, a handful of them, that are trying to crack into the data comm structure between the drone and the ground. So not only are they trying, they won't just jam it, they want to get in and take control of the drone, which means you have to crack, crack the, uh, the uh, uh, encryption and then take over control and you can do that because there's so there's a standard interface for controlling it. again if you're a nation state you're going to write your own interface where nobody knows how it's working but if you're taking it off the shelf and, and trying to do this or that then um, th then you use a standard interface that's easier to work into but uh, there's also the issue that if, if you really have a real bad guy a nation state but he knows if he gets caught in his hands with one of these very advanced uh, military attack drones, um, he's in trouble just because he has it. So if the committee try to take an off-the-shelf commercial drone and modify it slightly so that they can't be automatically nailed just by what they have in their hand. So I mean, you see it gets into a spy versus spy versus spy <laughs> world <Yeah>. pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. and it, but at a miniature scale. Yeah, and this is that's you know, uh, drones are very, very. They can be very lethal, and, and they can be yeah. very scary, especially if you get a bunch of them up at once. Uh, you know, I'm, so I'm glad you reminded me of that because I tend to think more on the civil side, where we're really dealing with the erroneous operation of a guy with uh, no real adverse intent. But but we shouldn't be jaded into that thinking, and uh, we've got to think that there are uh, people with intent out there, and uh, the opportunity is presented by the availability of systems of type for speaking. Wow, so it still goes back to the issue of we have to start somewhere. So in terms of uh, what you've kind of said here, John, is that uh, electromagnetic, electronic, and uh, visual, uh, as well as acoustic, are probably the frames of, of interpretation, frames of collection that need to be combined in some way uh, to pull down a good positive signal it doesn't have a lot of false positives so that's right. a multi sensor multi spectral analysis of some kind uh, trained so that it doesn't pick up birds or kites going through and uh, and, and and you've seen the bits and pieces of that uh, even recently as Jifix. Have, have you seen any place where this all is tied together into what might be considered a package it's starting to be packaged, but but it's still immature. It's still early. It's still early. Uh, so 
you know, it, and, and I think it's going to do what most markets do. It's going to segment. You're going to say, this is for downtown police within city streets within this kind of environment. Because remember, the electronic signatures in a in a in an urban environment are far different than one out in the field and one out, you know, somewhere else. And so the the actual environment that they play and work will will segment. So a, a counter drone environment. If you're a police force and you're in downtown Manhattan, you're going to have a different kind of counter drone set of tools than you are if you're, you know, in the middle of Iowa somewhere. So I think uh, the whole environment's different. The signatures are different. The correlation's different. Um, also, the, the distance of time. You can you can find some of these many miles away if you've got the right tool. Uh, and if you're a military establishment, you want to have you want to be able to find it five, seven, eight miles away if you can. But if you're if you're just looking for some uh, some hack in downtown Manhattan, you you only need a block or two. So I think it's a different different environment. We're going to see it segmenting here pretty quickly. Interesting. So we're going to see market fragmentation and uh, in the in the counter drone world, um, and it it still has to at the end of the day come down to something ideally as simple as the speed gun and uh, that's used to track speeders uh, so we've got we've got a ways to go here john uh, yeah but we, we do we but it's happening quickly i'll tell you that very quickly yeah and it's what's happening is i think what you're saying is quickly is the ability to uh, generate the drone based threat is happening faster than the counter drone understanding and standardizations coming together to deal with it. It's true, but you know, when you look at the drones that they've caught for ISIS, the ones they've used, and some of them other nation states, thankfully they're not as sophisticated as the ones that I've been indicating. Thankfully they're taken off the shelf and slapping a couple of things together and trying to do something. So at least right now, the ones that you really see in theater, the ones you really see in the field, they can cause a lot of damage even if they just have this little drone out there. I mean, I think in the last couple of weeks, a couple of drones have gotten close to uh, Navy planes in the Gulf. So, uh, you know, they, you don't have to be really, really sophisticated if you're in the right place at the right time. But I, I know it's happening. There's certainly lots of very bright people in these adversary countries. <laughs> you know they're working on it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually a very, very good way to uh, bring our conversation to a close because you've given the comfort that we're not, even though it's, you can imagine very complicated threats. What we're seeing is a straightforward threat of commercially modified or a system that's been modified from commercial, which has then in it the ability to track and identify it fairly well through the electronic connection between the ground controller and the drone. So if we take that as a perspective and branch from that, what I'd like to do is talk on the side about how we might implement that here in Hawaii in the next, uh, say, six to eight weeks, John. So uh, let me let me call you on the outside on that, and uh, well, thank okay. you for enlightening us here on uh, the range in which this can go, but then reining us back in to dealing with what is uh, near-term practical in terms of the threat and of the countermeasure. So John Mullen, President, CEO, uh, Chief Engineer, and uh, Marketing Manager at uh, Promia in San Francisco. Thanks for joining us again, and. Uh, We'll have to re remember exactly how this uh, electronic communication lash up works so we can get you next time. Okay, thanks, Dan. Okay, Thank see you, you all. Much. Bye.